Hey, what's up guys? So I just finished running a sim of all 1755 strategically unique flops. So in the game of No Limit Hold'em, there are 22,000 plus flops, but when you eliminate redundant flops, so flops that are like, you know, an ace, king, deuce, rainbow, is an ace, king, deuce, rainbow, no matter if it's a spade, diamond, heart, rainbow, or a club, diamond, heart, rainbow, ace, king, deuce, rainbow is still ace, king, deuce, rainbow. So when you eliminate redundant flops, you're left with 1,755. So what I wanted to do was quickly go over the sims and give you kind of a high-level overarching view of what strategy looks like from the button versus big blind to kind of warm you up for the more detailed content that I have on the way. First off, let's look at some frequencies. So you can see that we're checking 53.61% of the time. Now, this exact frequency is not is not the most precise frequency, and the reason for that is because we would actually need the redundant flops or we would need a count of the redundant flops. So we we'd want to see like if we have uh, five of diamonds, four of clubs, three of clubs, that would represent, I think, I think there, there are four different ways that this flop can exist. So we would have to weigh this for the amount of flops it actually represents. So this, uh, this frequency is unweighted, so it's not the closest thing, but it's probably much closer than what we'd get from pretty much any other sim, especially a subset sim, even a weighted subset. So I definitely intend on making some analysis, crunching some numbers to get you guys the real frequencies, but that'll take a little bit of time and I've been busy lately. So anyways, let's uh, let's get into the juicy stuff. So let's take a look at bet sizes, which bet sizes are used most often in aggregate. So the first thing I want to mention is a lot of you guys are telling me, why do I run sims with so many different bet sizes? And the reason for that is I, I want to understand the why behind different sizings. I want to understand the interaction of uh, ranges and their structures and the equity distributions. And I want to understand how that affects sizes. And in order to understand that, I have to I have to run different sizes. That being said, when you're playing poker, when you're at the table, you don't want to have a four bet size strategy. You're not going to be able to execute that effectively. So what I'm going to be talking about is which sizes you should use if you're building a strategy from the ground up. So if you are like somebody who's losing at low stakes right now, you should really just pick one bet size, max two bet sizes on the flop, and focus as much as possible on perfecting those one or two bet sizes. So if you were to pick one and only one bet size, I would use the quarter pot sizing. So this sizing is typically used when betting your entire range. So as you can see, uh, when we're using the quarter pot sizing, we are betting it at a pretty high frequency. Now, as you go to uh, flops where the quarter pot sizing is used more sparingly, you can see that other sizes do get mixed in. But this is the most commonly used GTO size. It is, if you were to only use this size, you would probably minimize your mistakes versus if you were only using a 75% pot size, you'd be making many more mistakes. Now, what are some of the drawbacks of only using a quarter pot size on the flop? So the drawbacks are you are going to be making some very big blunders on flops that don't use a quarter pot sizing at all and in fact use an overbet. So if you're missing out on spots where you should be betting using a polarized strategy rather than a merged strategy, you will have some blunders in your strategy. Now, if you're playing on micro stakes, it really doesn't matter because everybody has blunders at micro stakes. If you're at micro stakes, you will have blunders. Um, trying to expect that you wouldn't have a shit strategy at micro stakes um, is unrealistic. But the bright side is that you can win a ton of money with a shit strategy at micro stakes, and that's just fine. Now, if you're at low stakes or mid stakes, I would probably suggest 
using two bet sizes on the flop, but there are professional people, professional poker players, who are winning with only one bet size. So if they're winning with only one bet size and you're a losing player, I highly suggest just simplify your strategy as much as possible. So if you were to use a strategy that's more complicated, that goes beyond a quarter pot size, the next size I would mix in is either a 75% pot size or an overbet size. So the overbet is not used very frequently. So you might be getting a little bit, uh, you might be wondering, okay, why would you want to mix in overbets instead of just having a quarter pot and 75% pot? The reason for that is the times when you overbet are so vastly different from the times when you use a quarter pot sizing that it is very easy to execute an effective overbet strategy and execute an effective quarter pot size strategy and you it's not as confusing okay so like if you look at these flops where we're overbetting at a high frequency quarter pot sizes are pretty much not used at all and there's a very good reason for that overbets are used when ranges are polarized and quarter pot sizings are used when you're going against an air heavy range or you have a large raw equity advantage, nut advantage position, all those combined in one and your opponent's range doesn't really have any strong holdings. Overbets are used when your opponent has a lot of medium strength hands and you're not going to really derive much utility if you're not putting lots of pressure and forcing him to fold parts of his range. So if you look at a flop like um, Ace King 8 Two Tone, and we look at the big blind's range, the big blind has a lot of high value hands here. Okay, so the big blind has some two pairs, a lot of top pairs, very, like tons of middle pairs, weak pairs, which make up a large chunk of the range. Let's look at no made hands. You know, this is all the air. This is all the air in big blinds range. And some of this air uh, will still qualify as draws that big blind will defend with. So if you were to bet quarter pot sizing here, a GTO player would almost never fold and rightfully so would never fold, which is why the solver is not using it at all. So if you were to build a strategy from scratch, I would start with quarter pot. I'd get really good at quarter pot. I'd understand when to use it, when not to use it. And if you have a quarter pot slash check strategy, you're probably going to be checking in a lot of areas or scenarios where you'd want to use uh, a larger sizing. That's fine. If you're playing against weak players, it really doesn't matter. Now, so that's all said and done. Overbets are pretty easy to get good at because the strategy itself is so vastly different from the strategy you would use at other sizings that you won't get the, the two sizings mixed up or confused. So if you're going to, I wouldn't recommend going beyond two sizes and you definitely don't want to go onto four sizes. So one size that you can really just leave out of your strategy altogether is the full pot size. The full pot size is really not used enough. It's only 3.42% in aggregate. Uh, and even the flops where you do use a full pot size at a noticeable frequency, um, the remainder of the CBAT frequency is split between other sizes. So you're clearly, you're not losing a whole lot of EV by excluding this size from your strategy entirely. So that um, kind of covers a high-level overview of the sizings you'd want to choose and what you'd want to think about if you were building a CBET strategy from scratch. <laughs>